1981 and in 1982, Mount Pleasant, a small town in Vancouver, British Columbia, developed a new sense of fear. It became known that a sexual predator was prowling the town's neighborhoods, attacking women in their ground floor apartments, threatening them at knife point for sex. Vancouver in the early 1980s, a city full of promise, but there was a dark side, a rash of sex attacks. In the string of crimes were committed late at night in which the predator wore a turtleneck over his face to protect his identity. The attacker told the victims he was looking for someone who previously ripped him off in a drug deal. This attribute coined the former nickname, the Rip-Bop Rapist, that startled Mount Pleasant residents. Although the perpetrator attempted to hide his face, one victim got enough of a glimpse to allow for a creation of a police sketch. Once this sketch was released to the public, the police immediately received a tip. A Mount Pleasant woman claimed that the police sketch resembled her husband, a 35-year-old laborer, Ivan Henry. In an interview with police, Jesse Henry, Ivan Henry's wife, claimed that Ivan was often seen going out around midnight and coming home hours later. She talked about him carrying a knife and being ripped off on previous drug deals. Immediately, police began to take action. And so, the questions began to circulate. Who is Ivan Henry? The accused, Ivan Henry, who is convicted and appears destined to spend the rest of his life behind bars. Ivan Henry was a 35-year-old laborer at the time of the crimes committed. Henry was born on October 22, 1946, in Regina, Saskatchewan. From a young age, he suffered from emotional and physical abuse from his stepfather. At as early as 12 years old, he reported this abuse to child welfare services and was put into foster care. Because of his traumatic childhood, Henry's future began to decline. From as young as 14, his criminal record began to rise for drug trafficking and a dozen property crimes. To be put simple, Ivan Henry is no angel. Just before the 1982 string of crimes, Henry was on a mandatory release after serving most of a five-year charge for attempted rape in Winnipeg, Manitoba. After Ivan was released from prison, he and his common-law partner Jesse and their two children, aged 7 and 9 at the time, moved to Vancouver for a fresh start. A few days after the police sketch was released to the public, Henry received an unexpected knock on his door. The Vancouver Police Department entered his home without a warrant and questioned him about the string of sexual assaults in the neighborhood. Because his wife provided a tip to police, Henry became a primary suspect and was brought in for questioning. Throughout the beginning of this investigation, Henry immediately inserted his innocence. Henry was eventually brought in to participate in a police lineup in which the sexual assault victims were present. Because of Henry's unwillingness to participate, he became very uncooperative and aggressive to police officials.
During this police lineup, there is a photo showing of two ununiformed police officials holding Ivan Henry in a headlock smiling. Within this photograph, it is shown that the police officers were treating such procedure as a joke. Immediately, Ivan knew he wasn't getting out of there safely or soon. That they were zeroing in on me and there wasn't anything I could do about it. However, during the police lineup, three out of 11 victims identified Henry as the assailant through voice recognition in a similar body build. Because of this unreliable eyewitness testimony, police released Ivan but tapped his phone with surveillance teams that followed his every move. The police surveillance teams eventually lost track of Ivan and during that time another rape in Mount Pleasant occurred. Of course, Ivan was the first to be accused and in the time of July 1982, he was arrested and charged for 17 counts of rape, attempted rape, and indecent assault. He was held and detained in Mountain Institution in Agassiz, B.C. In an interview with CTV News, Ivan stated, Did you do it? No. No. Did you do any of those rapes? No. No, 100% not. Although Ivan was initially charged with 17 sexual offenses, he ended up being tried and convicted of only 10 counts in respect of the eight complaints. On November 24, 1983, Ivan Henry was declared a dangerous offender and was sentenced to indefinite detention. They don't care if you did it or not, you're going to jail. When the trial started, Henry refused any legal assistance and represented himself. Through this self-representation, Ivan was seen cross-examining the six complaints and offering own testimony and calling witnesses. In an interview with the Vancouver Sun, one of the victims said that she felt intimidated by Ivan's presence. I remember feeling smaller and smaller and smaller as those questions kept coming at me. Ivan even reached the news for his intimidation of the victims. During this investigation, it was deemed that Ivan Henry was fit to stand on trial. However, Vancouver psychologists diagnosed Ivan with psychosis and thought disorders. They described him as falling within the thin skull category. Ivan's main defense was that the charges laid had not occurred and that they never participated in a lineup with the six other complaints. Therefore, the evidence was unreliable. In turn, the Crown Council argued that Henry's refusal to be in the police lineup represents his consciousness of guilt. In 2002, the Vancouver Police Department began to reinvestigate 25 sexual assaults between April 1983 and July 1988, a time where Henry was in prison. During this series of events, the Vancouver Police Department linked three of the cases with DNA evidence to a resident of Mount Pleasant, Donald McRae. Here, I will examine the causes that led to Ivan Henry's wrongful conviction. Number 1. The Police Lineup As previously shown, during the police lineup, there is a photo shown 
of two police officials holding Ivan Henry in a headlock, laughing and smiling. anybody viewing that live lineup for, from a, an adjacent room would be struck by this uh, extraordinary sight and uh, their attention would be drawn to the to the person who's in in the headlock and obviously he would look guilty number two eyewitness misidentification Within this police lineup, only three out of the 11 complaints participated. The victims recognized Ivan only by his voice and a similar body build. Number three, photo setup. Within the mugshot sent to the victims, Ivan Henry was the only person whose picture was behind bars. Number four, wife's statement. As previously discussed, Ivan Henry's wife, Jessie, stated that Ivan had often been seen leaving the house late and owned a knife. A few months later, she recanted her statement and said that her husband was not the predator. What was the motive for that, you may ask? Jesse received an $1,000 reward for the statement, and she needed the money for drugs. Yeah, she said she took a, a bribe of $1,000 to say that it was my dad. Number five, tunnel vision. When considering the modus operandi, the Vancouver Police Department never looked for any more suspects after they brought in Ivan for questioning. Number six, high profile case. Because this crime affected so many victims, the Vancouver Police Department felt a rush to question and detain a possible suspect to make the community feel secure. By doing this, police officials rushed to a conclusion without proper evidence to back it up. Which then leads to number seven, lack of disclosure. The Vancouver Police Department withheld evidence throughout the trial and investigation. No fingerprint evidence, no hair evidence. Um, no physical evidence of any kind. They failed to report DNA evidence in trial and semen samples in the rape kit were conveniently lost. It is important to note that throughout all of this, Ivan maintained his innocence. In 2008, a three-panel discussion of the British Columbia Court of Appeal reheard more extensive arguments made by Henry whether the offenses attributed to McRae. During the same time, the BC Court of Appeal argued that the trial judge erred by saying that the evidence that Henry was reluctant to a police lineup represented his guilt. Further, the appeal argued that each charge should have been granted a separate trial and therefore the verdict was unreasonable. Ivan's appeal then got directed to a special prosecutor, Len Deust, to depict whether Henry had been wrongfully convicted. In 2008, Len recommended Ivan for an appeal. Finally, in January 2009, Ivan Henry was released on bail pending appeal hearing. During this time, he was placed on house arrest with maximum security. On October 27, 2010, 27 years after Ivan had entered prison, the case was overturned and he was set free.
Ivan was finally able to reunite with his two daughters 27 years later. In 2011, Henry filed a lawsuit in BC Supreme Court against the City of Vancouver, the Vancouver Police Department, and the BC Supreme Court for the 27 lost years of his life. When asked about the effects of his wrongful conviction, he responded with, I've lost everything, the world has changed so much. Fast forward to 2017, Ivan received only $8 million in compensation for the wrongful conviction. Ivan applied for more, but it was dismissed by the BC Court of Appeal. Now I will examine the aftermath effects of Ivan Henry's wrongful conviction. Ivan did not get the chance to watch his daughters grow up, and his daughters had no father figure throughout their whole life. He was in loss of a job and stable income for 27 years. He also developed PTSD and depressive disorders that continually affect him. He had to adapt to the changed world he missed out on for years. Although he was set free, Ivan still continually has to prove his innocence to others and his family. He was not compensated enough for the mistakes not of his own, but everyone else. All these effects are all for a crime that he did not commit. Overall, this case demonstrates the reality of the commonality of miscarriages of justice in the legal system. Ivan Henry lost 27 years of his life for the wrongdoings of others. The criminal justice system, the government, and the police departments ultimately failed him. There needs to be a change in the procedures that cause wrongful convictions. 27 years for others' mistakes is unacceptable.